Hello, my name is Natalia Gervitz. I am a scientist in Lebedev Physical Institute of the Russian Academy of Sciences. I am working in the uh, solid state in the Mar laboratory, and today I am here to observe for you the nuclear magnetic resonance and NMR spectroscopy. Let's start with history of NMR spectroscopy in Nobel Prizes. There are many Nobel, pri Nobel Prizes uh, obtained for NMR spectroscopy. The birthday of NMR spectroscopy was in 1946. It, it was the year when simultaneously and independently Ed, Edward Purcell and Felix Bloch described the method for measurement of nuclear magnetic uh, moments of the matter. Of course, this work was preceded by a set of other discoveries and investigations such as Isidore Rabi's uh, discovery, he got the Nobel Prize for it in 1944, and uh, discovery of Otto Stern. We'll, we'll talk about him a bit later. Then, when the mythology was standardized, the NMR spectroscopy uh, was used and applied in many, many other spheres, and chemistry, and medicine, and even in security. And other Nobel Prizes are uh, were uh, awarded usually for chemistry and medicine. Let's start up over. We will talk about particles. What is a particle? Of course, you all know what is atom, what are the origins of the name atom, and of course you know that atom is not really uncuttable as it should be. So let's skip uh, to particles. What is a particle? A particle is a localized object. Uh, it can be of different size, it can be of different charge, uh, it can be a grain of, of powder, it could be a neutron, neutrino, it can be proton, atom, iron, etc. So, all of them are localized objects and have some properties. When we are talking about the properties of particle, we should know that there are two types of properties. Some of the properties are intrinsic and some of them are extrinsic. What is an intrinsic property? It is a property which is an attribute of particle itself and it isn't changing whenever, uh, whenever the water is going to the particle. And the extrinsic pro property is a property which depends not only on the particle but on the lo localization, location and the fields surrounding this particle. For example, when we are go, uh, talking about the most uh, known property, mass, is it extrinsic or intrinsic? Of course, it is in intrinsic. But when we are talking about weight, it's definitely extrinsic property, depending on the uh, uh, gravity field, this particle is located. So, extrinsic properties are these, linear momentum, orbital angular momentum, position, energy, etc. And intrinsic properties are mass, charge, spin. While mass and charge are very well known and we, are, we always talk about mass of, of some objects and about charge, it is positive or negative, even non-physicists know what it is. But the spin is the property usually confused with charge. You should never confuse it. We will look at it uh, at spin more precisely and you will understand that sometimes the uncharged neutral particle can have a, a spin and uh, possess the uh, properties which are linked with the uh, spin. Why do we uh, talk about spin? When uh, was, it, was it found? In 1922, Stern designed and Gerlach conducted experiment the goal of which was to um, investigate the presence of angular momentum at particles. Uh, the particles were silver atoms. And he found that not only this angular momentum exists, he found two more interesting things. How was this uh, experiment designed? Here you see that there is a source of um, atoms, a furnace, and the beam of silver atoms was going through a, a set of collimators and an inhomogeneous magnetic field. What uh, did they expect? They expected that there is uh, some response 
which these silver uh, atoms, due to their angular momentum, give to the homogeneous magnetic field. And they are waiting to see the picture we see uh, at number four, some solid line, which uh, shows us the distribution of this angular momentum. But they observed, not classically expected result, they observed result picture five. There are two quantized points where these uh, atoms uh, found their cells at the end of the experiment. What did it tell them? It, it told the scientists that there are two quantized uh, values of this angular momentum, and um, the number of atoms of these values, values was almost equal. And there is no classically continuously distributed values of this momentum for the atoms. So they uh, found out that this property, now we will call this property spin, is quantized. It can be of uh, a set of values. The other result of this experiment was the fact that when we measure the um, projection of uh, this property on one of the axes, the me measurement itself destroys the information about projections on two other axes. So now we can talk about spin. What is a spin? Despite the literal meaning of the word spin, it's incorrect to say that it's really spinning or rotating around the axis of this object. But in literature, you very often can come across um, the um, description of the spin as the process of rotating around this axis. It usually doesn't influence the further investigation, so if it is more comfortable to think about spin as some process of spinning, it's okay at some, at some point, but you should know that spin is just a property, it's a quantum number, uh, which represents the intrinsic angular momentum of this particle and is not associated with mo movement or rotation of the particle as a whole. The uh, value of the spin is always half integer. It's integer a second. If uh, the value is integer, it, the particle is called boson. If the value is half integer, the, the particle is called fermion. Uh, here is the Niels Bohr's model of the atom. It was proposed in 1913, and we can see here that we have a positive core nuclear, which, is, uh, which consists of uh, protons and neutrons. And we have a, a set of electrons on orbits. Our lecture today is called Nuclear Magnetic Resonance, so today we will draw our attention only to the core. What we can see to the nuclear? What we can see in the nuclear? Protons. We are used to think that they are positive. And neutrons. We, we are used to think that they are neutral. It's not right when we are talking about spin. They both are fermions and they have a half inter integer spin. You should remember this. And how can we uh, count the total spin of the nu nuclear? Is it a sum or a what? To define the spin of the nuclear, we need to know the Pauli exclusion pr principle. It sounds like this. Two or more identical fermions, fermions, not bosons, cannot simultaneously occupy the same quantum state within a quantum system. So there is, a, as you know, a set of quantum numbers for each particle. And if this particle is fermion, uh, there could not, there cannot be another fermion, fermion of this type in this system with the same type of numbers. So we should we should take it into account when we want to know the spin of the nuclear. But there is a very uh, important word here: identical. You should remember that protons and neutrons are not identical, and they obey this. Uh, power exclusion principle, but they obey it separately. If the numbers of protons and neutrons in the nuclear are both even, 
the spin of the nuclei is zero. If they both are odd, the spin is integer. If their sum is odd, the spin is non-integer. On the next slide, we will see some examples of different isotopes, and you will see that different isotopes of one atom have different spins. Why? Because they have a different number of neutrons. Non-zero spin signals of non-zero angular momentum, which in its turn is connected to the magnetic moment through a magnetic ratio specific for each nucleus. When there is some external field, the magnetic moments exhibit precession around the direction of the field with larmor frequency. During the precession, the magnetic moments draw cones around the direction of external field. The spin of the nucleus is the maximum value of the projection of its own angular momentum onto the selected axis, J. Due to the quantum nature of the spin, there is a set of 2i plus 1 projections. This number is called multiplicity, and uh, the multiplicity for half integer spin particle is 2, as it's seen on the picture on the right. On this slide, you can see the characteristics of the most popular NMR nuclei. The first uh, is the name of the nuclei, then we see the spin of the uh, distinguished uh, isotopes of the nuclei, the gear magnetic ratio, the natural abundance, and the quadrupole moment. About quadrupole moment we will talk about a bit later. Uh, now we will talk about spin. Uh, we have already discussed that the spin depends on the um, uh, number of protons and neutrons in nuclei. Some of the atoms have isotopes. The isotopes uh, are, for example, copper here. These uh, isotopes have different number of neutrons, so they have different spins. Uh, gear magnetic ratio shows us how sensitive these nuclei is as a probe for a mass spectroscopy. For example, the nuclei with um, the gear magnetic ratio about 40 are very sensitive and very useful as a probe and are, and are very often used. Natural abundance. Sometimes we can use only one of the isotopes of this element, but the uh, elements uh, go usually go as a combination of, of isotopes, and sometimes this uh, lucky isotope is about 90 or 100 percent of the uh, in, of natural abundance, but sometimes, as in the case of iron. There is about only 2% the NMR responsive uh, iron 57th in the um, natural abundance. So when we work the, with iron, we need a lot of uh, the sample and a lot of iron at all, and especially a lot of iron 57th in the sample, or we need to use the enriched uh, with isotope iron 57th uh, iron. And about quadruple moment, we'll talk about later, but uh, the half integer, a, when spin is a second uh, nuclear, are the best nuclear for NMR spectroscopy, while others, uh, which have the bigger spin, um, have more, uh, less intensive and more difficult to, for simulation spectra because there are quadruple effects. Let's look how external field influences on the uh, fermions. Uh, look at this situation. We have a system of fermions, half integer spins in zero field. There is no preferable direct direction. They are directed randomly. Then, when we turn on the external field B, all the spins align along the axis B uh, parallelly and anti-parallelly to the direction of the field. Those two positions form two energy levels with higher and lower energy and different population, described by Boltzmann equation. Obviously, the lower energy level is more populated. It is the level which uh, the spins of which are uh, oriented parallel to the magnetic field. The difference in population is very small. You can see it in the picture on the right cor corner. It's about 
10 or tens of spins and it depends on the uh, value of the field and this difference in of population gives us the net magnetization macroscopic net magnetization which in its turn is continuous not quantized it is directed of course along with the field now we can use radio frequency pulses to influence the population of these levels and to observe how the system returns to initial state due to the process of relaxation. It is essential to say a few words about nuclear quadrupole resonance, since for nuclear with spin bigger than a second, it influences the spectra. When the spin is bigger than a second, the nuclei is no more spherically symmetrical. Now they are elongated or flattened along the angular momentum. And so they have a quadruple moment and it is ready to interact with electrical field gradient if it is present. Sources of electrical field gradient can be valence electrons, surrounding ions and internal shells. This slide shows us a scale of energies and frequencies in various units. Kelvins, electron volts, inverse centimeters, hertz. Uh, the red, red stripe marks the region from approximately 10 megahertz to 1 gigahertz. This is the region where NMR is observed. Here you can see that the region where NQR is observed is a little bigger, but it also includes the region of an NMR observation. So it interferes a bit and changes the picture of the spectrum. Uh, the upper limit of the NMR observation is uh, determined in instrumentally by the magnitude of the magnetic fields of existing superconducting magnets and uh, can be uh, shifted upward somehow, for example, using pulsed field. From this figure, it is clear that the energy of NMR interaction is very small up to uh, 100 millikelvin, which is significantly lower than the energy of microwave, infrared, and especially optical experiment. So NMR proves to be a very sensitive method. Uh, let's explore the influence of NMR and NQR. Uh, on the right side, you can, uh, you can see the uh, nuclear magnetic resonance picture for a three a second spin. Here we can see that the energy level was divided by the applied field to uh, four equidistant sublevels uh, corresponding to different projection, different uh, values of projection to the axis. They are minus three a second, uh, minus a second, plus a second, plus three a second. We can see that they are equidistant. The distance between them uh, depends on the field. And uh, if the field becomes bigger, this distance also becomes bigger. Uh, to move uh, the system from one state to another, we should give, give it some more energy. But there are selection rules here on the left. And there is a rule that well, it's a quantum system. So we need to, to be precise with energy and we have to give the system the energy uh, which equals the uh, destinations. We have to provide the energy which is precise and uh, equals the uh, difference between the energy of two sublevels. So the frequency of the radio, radio pulse is determined by the field. On the other hand, or on the left side of the slide, we can see the other extreme condition when there is no external field and no internal field, but there is nuclear quadruple resonance. There is a quadruple moment because the spin is 3 a second and uh, there is a electric field gradient EFG. We can see that in this case uh, we have two sublevels plus minus 3 a second and plus minus 1 a second and one transition between them. But you should see that here 
there's one line on the spectrum because there is one energy, one transition. But on the right, when we have no electric field gradient, uh, but oh, we have a magnetic field, there's also one, one line. There are three transitions, but these sublevels are equidistant. So uh, the energy needed to uh, change the sublevel is the same. And all these transitions give the one line on the one frequency. But when we have both the nuclear magnetic interaction and nuclear quadrupole interaction, there is some um, picture in the middle of them. We can see that there are, uh, the, the sublevels move, change their energy, and the difference between uh, sublevels becomes uh, not equidistant. And we can get four or three lines which depends on the energy of nuclear magnetic and nuclear quadrupole interactions. Which isotopes are good for NMR? Let's look at the period periodic table itself. Here are the colored um, elements. The colored elements are the elements which have uh, the isotopes with non-zero spin. As we remember, the most convenient uh, spin for NMR is a second. The a second uh, isotopes are colored in blue. When the spin is bigger, uh, there are other colors. So the blue elements here are the best NMR um, nuclei, and the other colored elements here are good for are good for NMR and good for NQR. Also, uh, you should know that there are two modes of measuring the spectrum. The first mode of measuring spectrum is field sweep in the MAR. It is the case when we just uh, make the frequency constant and change the field. And we see how the system responds to the different, to dif different fields. And the second mode is frequency sweep in the MAR. When we uh, make the field, external field constant, and uh, move along the frequency axis. There is a set of properties of an MR spectrum which provide us the information of the sample. Uh, there are statistical characteristics. We can get local magnetic fields. We can, we can uh, know about hyperfine interactions. Uh, for example, when the NMR spectrum is broad, broadened, tells us about the presence of some spin interaction in the uh, system. When we see chemical shift, it tells us about the change of the local field, fields on the nuclear. What is chemical shift? Look at the right uh, side of this picture. Here we again see the sublevels for spin 3 second we can see that they are equidistant and there are three transition, transitions which give us one line. The frequency of this line, as we already know, depends on the applied field and field on the nuclear itself. But uh, when this field changes, external field changes, or something is not usual with the system, the li this line changes its position too. So we see the chemical shift. And also we can study the dynamical characteristics, spin dynamics, field fl fluctuations. For uh, studying these characteristics, we uh, observe spin lattice relaxation. It is the speed at which uh, the ensemble of nuclear spins tend to return to thermodynamic equilibrium. For example, uh, one should know the Coringa's law for metals, which um, binds the chemical shift, relaxation, and the temperature uh, for metals. Let's summarize what we already know about nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. By definition, it's the registration of transitions between magnetic energy levels of nuclear with non-zero spin 
caused by radio frequency radiation. It works for non-zero spins, the, the best it works for a second spins, half integer spins. When uh, there is no field on the nuclear, usually no external field, we see chaotic orientation. When we apply a magnetic field, the spins align parallelly or anti-parallelly to the uh, orientation of this field and form energy sublevel to I plus 1. Now we can initiate the transition from one energy level to another le energy level. And we do it by applying a quant of radio frequency pulse with uh, energy equal to the distance between the neighboring sublevels. There is a problem that the pulses are much more powerful than the signal being studied. So we need to separate them in time. To do this, we use this elegant method based on an effect of discovered by Erwin Hahn in 1950. It's called Hahn echo sequence. It is one of the ways to separate in time the radio frequency pulses and much weaker signal of nuclear spin. We use two pulses. Here you can see the animation. The vertical red arrow is the average magnetic moment of a group of spins, such as protons. All are vertical in the vertical magnetic field and spinning on their long axis. We apply a 90 degrees pulse and it flips the arrow into the horizontal xy plane. Due to the local magnetic field in homogeneities, as the net moment processes, some spins slow down due to lower local field strength and begin to progressively trail behind, while some speed up due to higher field strength and start getting ahead of the others. This makes the signal decay. 180 degrees P pulse is now applied so that the slower spins lead ahead of the main moment and the fast ones trail behind. Progressively, the fast moments catch up with the main moment and the slow moments drift back toward the main moment. Here, the sampling of the echo starts. The Inamar spectroscopy is a powerful tool used in many, many fields in physics, in fundamental physics, in applied physics, in medicine, uh, and in chemistry. And now I'll go to tell you about some examples of studies conducted in our laboratory. For example, bismuth therite. It is a very, very well-known multiferroic with vast perspectives, but there is a special uh, spin-modulated magnetic structure in it. So it is very uh, interesting to know uh, how we influence this uh, spin-modulated structure of cycloid type by some uh, means, for example, by doping or by nanostructuring the samples. And NMR helps in this case a lot. As I have already said, the doping is one of the ways to influence this magnetic, uh, magnetic structure. It can be modified, it can be suppressed, it, it can be uh, strengthened. So, we conducted a series of research to see how the doping by lantanium, terbium, or strontium influences the uh, magnetic structure and magnetic properties of the uh, bismuth therite. Here you can see the spectra obtained uh, for lantanium doped bismuth therite for the level of doping from, in range from uh, 0 to 25%. Here you can see that the NMR spectroscopy is a very sensitive method. We have found the uh, high field line. It lies to the right of the main spectrum, never uh, found by other methods. And uh, we connected it with the iron atoms, which are located uh, in the neighborhood of doping atoms. And we can see that the uh, special spin modulated structure gives us the uh, specific shape of the spectra. It's the two peaks and steep slopes. Uh, you see the, the, the best it is shown on the black uh, 
black squared spectrum. But upon doping uh, by lanthanum, the structure of this spectrum modifies, and we see that the peaks become equivalent, more uh, equivalent. And at 25% doping, we see that this structure no more exists. It has uh, gone. It, it was suppressed by lanthanum doping. These measurements were supported uh, by magnetization measurements later. The other interested exam interesting example is investigation of superparmagnetic. You can see here this compound and the properties of magnetic properties of this compound strongly depend on the doping on the level of doping by oxygen. When the number of oxygens is six per unit, we see here, uh, it is an antiferromagnetic. But when the number of oxygens uh, per unit increases, we uh, see a superconductor. What happens? Uh, there are two copper positions. And uh, the copper in the first position in the antiferromagnet is two coordinated while the copper in first position in superconductor uh, is integrated in the chain of squares. You can see the uh, yellow uh, points here. The question is, what are the values and orientation of the fields uh, on the nucleus here? And then NMR is the method which can uh, give the answer to this question. Let's look how we did. We didn't even uh, need the external field for it because there is a field on uh, the copper atoms without external field. So we uh, measured the NMR spectrum for, uh, anti for extreme uh, compounds with six oxygens and uh, seven oxygens. What have we found? Do you remember that there were two isotopes of copper in the table above? So here we will look just at one isotope and the other lines we're not talking about are the lines for the other isotope. Here we can see that the spectra for antiferromagnet has uh, three transitions and three lines, yellow, magenta and red lines, and they are located at 90 megahertz, a very big field. While in case of superconductor, we have only one line. Note that the other line here on top stands for other isotope of copper. And the field on uh, the nuclear of copper for this line is significantly smaller. It's, uh, the line is located on 30 megahertz. So, Using NMR spectroscopy, we uh, defined the fields on the nuclear on uh, copper 2 position, and we even studied the magnetic structure of the antiferromagnet compound. It is G type magnetic structure. The magnetic uh, field at copper 2 position is about 7.6 Tesla. And all these uh, studies were, were later confirmed by neutron experiment. Now I'll tell you a, a little about our laboratory. We have magnets with static fields of 5.5 5 and 7.3 Tesla, and new queer-free magnetic system that allows us to work with fields up to 12 Tesla and with temperatures up to 400 degrees. This set of equipment allows us uh, to simultaneously uh, conduct research on a set of various compounds and systems. And here are the pictures of our experimental setups. You can find out more about our scientific group in the section of Solid State and MR Laboratory on the Lebedev in Institute web website. Uh, we, we even have the QR code here and we are ready for any discussion and friendship and collaboration. Thank you for your attention.